go. Howdy, I'm Rahul, it's Abdullah, Asmahan, Fahad, and Noof. We're group 10 and we'll be presenting our engineering 482 term paper. Where do we draw the line? It's a discussion on engineering ethics and weapons design. Now, engineers have been uh, widely viewed as pursuing technological progress for societal good. But on the flip side, um, right from tanks to uh, warplanes to the mortars and the atom bomb, they were all um, created by engineers as well. However, uh, one can argue that the weapons designed uh, justly saved many more lives than they took. And that is precisely why the defense industry is so heavily invested in and um, it's so important uh, to discuss ethics with regards to the defense industry. Next slide, please. If engineers who are in name bound by uh, ethical codes do not design weapons, somebody else will, and uh, they will not consider the consequences of their designs or actions. This is especially so when you consider that weapons are always in need. Um, nations require weapons for the deterrence they cause hostile entities, and uh, also to project their national strength on a global stage. Uh, hence, it is, uh, hence our thesis. It is ethical for engineers to design weapons, but there is a line that we need to follow uh, where weapons design becomes unethical. Agent Orange, nuclear weapons, and bioweapons, all those which cause massive collateral damage to all across, uh, all across the board fall across this line. Now that we have set this premise, we can discuss why engineers in the defense industry have to consider the ethical implications of the design and why we should draw this line. But first, uh, the question is whether engineers can afford to be ethical. The engineering profession these days uh, is one where the engineers are employees and they have a strict contract uh, which, uh, which details the responsibilities and duties. And most of the times they don't know what the small component they're working on uh, will be used to do or will be used uh, to uh, will, will become a part of hence um, hence uh, it becomes difficult for engineers to choose to be ethical also if one person does not follow the ethical codes it loses its effectiveness as uh, that person or that group of people who do not follow the codes will be the go-to people for unethical uh, stuff and it defeats the purpose yet we need to consider the implications of working and uh, the design as engineers who make, the, who make our livelihood every day based on the NSB code of ethics, which details that individuals are responsible, uh, are held responsible for their work. Fahad will now explain our motives for choosing this topic and the motives behind uh, designing weapons. Okay, so uh, to start off with the motives behind designing weapons, uh, we looked at uh, Martin Hirsch's argument at which he the researched the tendency of engineers to shift toward the military sector and the weapon designing and development uh, uh, approach over the peace building and the sustainable development of the society. Now, he mentioned two main motivations that uh, pushes those engineers towards that path. Uh, the first one being that engineers tend to focus on the legality of issues and the microethics over the morality of issues and the ma macroethics. Now, this, is, this can be mainly correlated to Kohlberg's uh, moral development stages, where engineers tend to fall in the conventional level at which they only focus on the legality of issues and uh, uh, overlook or fail to notice the uh, bigger picture. He validated uh, those, uh, this claim by a case study where chemical engineers uh, were designing uh, weapons, uh, weapons uh, uh, that were lethal, and at the same time they were disposing and storing hazardous waste. The government convicted them of uh, of the legality based on the legality of uh, the hazardous waste, but completely overlooked the morality of uh, developing the weapons. Uh, now this sort of uh, situation uh, creates a, a, a concept of normalization where the designing and the development uh, of the weapons are not questioned on a moral or ethical stance. Uh, having said that, uh, the second uh, motivation would be that engineers are influenced at their early stages of their career. And this is mainly because of the environment that uh, they are present in. So when we talk about engineers who are in military dominated governments or institutions, they are more uh, likely to be influenced uh, and uh, 
uh, pushed toward the designing and the development sector. Uh, also, research and technology that advances through time is a main uh, influencer to those uh, young engineers. Now, after looking at the motivations, uh, the, we come to the reason why we chose this topic. Uh, so on the next slide, this topic should be addressed uh, mainly because the designing and the development of the weapons touches upon our standards as engineers. And uh, had it uh, been uh, taken or uh, uh, to, uh, done in, improperly, uh, especially by young engineers, it would uh, cause uh, a, vi uh, a violation to our standards and that is uh, not, ac uh, not acceptable. Uh, and based on that, uh, we should uh, address the topic as it, uh, it, it, is, uh, it touches upon our uh, ethical and moral uh, uh, standards. Now I'll pass on the presentation to Noof where she will talk about the Just War Theory. So uh, we decided to use uh, the Just War Theory to justify the design of weapons and for drawing the line on the design of weapons. The Just War Theory states that under certain condition, it is ethically acceptable to conduct war. According to this theory, wars are ethical when fought for valid reasons. The US does not have an official law that considers the Just War Theory as a criteria for engaging in, in a war. The Just War Theory has two principles. The first is proportionality, which means that countries engaged in a war and other affected countries need to be considered while deciding whether it is a justifiable reason for war to happen. The second, which is discrimi discrimination, doesn't allow intentional attacks on non-military targets and civilians. This is done so that harm is minimized. The just war theory uh, says that uh, war is permitted in case of self-defense. So we took a quote from the literature review, which says that, a person who fails to prevent an attack is as guilty as a person who commits the crime. So this raises the question, what if an action was not taken in that matter? We will be using uh, this theory as a guideline to discuss weapon designs that go beyond individual weapons and the ones that cause mass destruction. We believe this theory can be adjusted slightly because it is acceptable in ideal cases, but in real life, we can predict when a war might, hap might happen. So looking at it from an individualistic point of view, Countries need to be prepared for war by keeping weapons ready for future use. The Just War Theory states that it is acceptable to develop weapons under certain conditions, but in fact, we can't predict the future. The ethical engineer may design the weapon which minimizes mass destruction and the loss of civilian lives, while another engineer might not do it responsibly. Utilitarianism says that we as engineers should look at it and we should look at the greater good and it's our duty to improve the lives of the majority by considering all civilians. We think that negative responsibility is another major reason for developing weapons. We do not live in a utopian world, so not preventing an attack can be a negative responsibility. As an engineer, if we don't develop weapons, then it doesn't mean that we are protecting people from harm. In fact, it might lead to losing a war and the lives of people as weapons were not developed by engineers as a preventative measure. Now, in the case of self-defense, uh, weapon design doesn't always aim to pose destructive risks. Instead, it plays a vital role in threatening the enemy. Moreover, when considering a case of uh, self-defense, any object is considered a weapon. Objects such as pepper, spr uh, pepper sprays, tasers, or even high heels all play a major role in harming those who tend to harm the innocent. The right to self-defense is practiced in a situation where one must protect oneself from an attack, thereby introducing the rights protection theory which indicates that criminal punishment is a fraction of a bigger institution of rights protection. According to the literature review we've done, the previous theory is classified under self-defense because it views the right to punish as obtained from the right of the community to defend itself. Uh, research has also indicated that defensive acts by victims have a significant impact on outcomes of crimes. And the effects of armed resistance differs from unarmed resistance which uh, abides by the utilitarian rule as a greater number of uh, people seek, uh, seek to defend themselves with the use of weapons leads to greater number of innocent lives being saved. Let us now discuss how responsible engineers are for their work. We believe that their use is justified in cases which align with the just war theory. One may argue that outside of a justified scenario, those same weapons may be used by a bad actor for unjustified malicious purposes. Well, we don't think that the engineer can be held accountable for the weapon's intentional or accidental exchange of hands that may take place long after the inception of that weapon. Furthermore, they simply may not be able to predict what happens to their weapon beyond their immediate client. 
So just as Fitzgerald stated, we believe that an engineer is ethically right if they choose employers and projects that conform to the just war theory. The harm test can be used to analyze the situation. In this case, it would result in more benefit, which outweighs the harm caused by advanced non-lethal weapons. That's because in the absence of these type of weapons, their counterparts would be used, which indiscriminately mass target groups of people. The second test, which is the reversibility test, can be applied in the context of bad actors acquiring weapons and turning them towards innocent groups of people. If we traded places with the innocent people being targeted, we would prefer the aggressors carrying advanced non-lethal weapons that target only specific people among us. Let's talk about why we are in support of advanced weapons research. Development of weapons that showcases a nation's offensive power can contribute towards deterring other nations from engaging in conflict. This contributes indirectly to maintaining peace between countries and allows engineers, therefore, to fulfill the call to protecting the people's health, safety, and welfare. Bernard A. All's work proved that a party's lack of escalation in the face of aggression causes them not to retaliate. Escalation stands for a party being able to increase its, its own coercive capability in reply. We think that coercive power in this case can take the form of advanced non-lethal weapon systems and hence have a potential to deter other countries from rising up in conflict, given that the cost in increasing their own coercive power or escalation remains low. This idea, therefore, can serve as a guideline for engineers conducting advanced weapons research. Let's talk about the importance of harm minimization. Akbulut Yuxel's work concluded that children born and raised in areas that were exposed to conflict during the Second World War had higher body mass indices and were more likely to be obese as adults. Adverse effects are seen in economic activity and trade volume of losing nations as well. Glick and Taylor have shown that even after conflicts end, the trade volume does not reach its pre-war levels for many years. In light of such adverse effects, the principle of harm minimization becomes ever important. That's because under this principle, the goal would be to inflict only as much harm on the opponent as is needed to subdue their capabilities. An engineer's role, therefore, must be to design only such weapons that are capable enough to target only certain and specific aspects of the opponent's assets without indiscriminately destroying others. This would also be consistent with the NSPE's Code of Ethics, which holds the health, safety, and welfare of the public as paramount. Continuing uh, what, what my colleague mentioned, non-lethal weapons, which engineers are capable of designing, uh, can be a, uh, an alternative to the current lethal weapons uh, that are in the circulation. Examples of this are in self-defense, the pepper spray the, and the taser. Um, it, while in the military, it uh, goes up to like stun guns and uh, even the strategic level where cyber weapons are uh, alternatives to um, present the lethal solutions. So it becomes a positive obligation. It evolves to a positive obligation from uh, an ethical possibility. That is engineers are obligated uh, to society to design non-lethal weapons. Uh, we'll look uh, closely at cyber weapons and how they um, and how they can support our argument. Denning and Strasser in 2013 studied cyber weapons as uh, an alternative to kinetic weapons in um, in in wars or large conflicts, and they found that states nowadays uh, are morally obligated to use cyber weapons instead of kinetic weapons where they can or when they can uh, when they don't lose strategic capability. And this was supported by Rooney, uh, whose paper uh, studied two attacks, two cyber attacks, which deterred uh, the nuclear threat by, um, in, uh, by a hostile nation. And this is perhaps the greatest uh, support for our argument, as it clearly mentions, as it clearly shows how uh, engineers and their development and the designs of the uh, cyber weapons or new age weapons can turn around the certain the, the current day case where national strength is determined entirely by uh, their military strength or the lethal weapons they have. For uh, carrying on on what uh, my colleague Rahul was uh, talking about, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to advanced uh, weapons uh, in terms of the technology, we have to mention autonomous weapons which can range from anything such as self-detonating landmines to uh, human-sized killing uh, machines. 
However, a generic definition would be any weapon that can perform a task or operation without human oversight. Now, two main critics uh, argued in favor and against the autonomy in weapon design, especially when it comes to ethical uh, implications and moral uh, implications. Arkin, who was in favor, uh, stated that uh, autonomous weapons have no self-preservation, which make them much more focused in their tasks, and uh, that supports uh, basically their uh, efficiency when it comes to uh, winning a war. So uh, by being uh, non-self-preserved, they can act in a sacrificial manner. And uh, at the same time, you could limit uh, sending your troops and basically having them uh, be killed. Uh, also, he stated that autonomous weapons have a huge advantage over uh, in the war uh, in terms of uh, information processing and uh, the speed of information processing, which is mainly concerned with the efficiency and how fast uh, they can deliver their tasks and uh, operations, and that can change uh, the tide of the war within seconds. And finally, the lack of emotions within autonomous weapons. They lack the human feelings, they lack the human traits, which make them uh, more determined on their uh, specific jobs and not uh, prone to be swayed when it comes to uh, decisions that can change the tide of the war. Also, we could mention that uh, the past wars uh, that human ways were all driven by those emotions and that causes overuse of uh, violence and uh, unnecessary damage. On the other hand, Sparrow argued against the autonomous weapon design and he mentioned two main points. Uh, one is the lack of abstract reasoning within uh, the autonomous weapons, which prevents them from having a valid uh, ethical judgment of the situation. This could be related uh, with the just, uh, uh, the just War Theory that I'll explain further on the next slide. Also, the, uh, it's dis uh, disrespectful towards humans, mainly because the interpersonal relationship between the one who's uh, initiating the attack and ordering the attack uh, from the weapon to the one receiving the attack uh, uh, is lost. So uh, that can be disrespectful and uh, immoral. Uh, based on the people and uh, our stance, uh, we, uh, we uh, in terms of the autonomous weapons, we agree with Arkin to some extent. So by applying the principles of the law and war, proportionality ensures that benefits must outweigh the harms. So this would mean that uh, the outcome of the war should uh, be uh, result in less uh, lives being lost uh, for, uh, based on the use of the autonomous weapons. Discrimination uh, means that uh, autonomous weapons must be able to distinguish clearly uh, who is involved in the war, who is not. And finally, immunity uh, eliminates the possibility of using autonomous weapons of mass destruction where the damage could extend further and cause unnecessary violence. Now I'll pass on the presentation to my colleague Nouf where she will talk about the nuclear weapons and where do we draw the line. So uh, what are the limitations and where do we think the line should be drawn for designing weapons? Nuclear technology is seeing continuous development. Uh, the authors state that there has been significant work done in, de in designing the ethics of nuclear technology. Yet there is a lot of work to be done in this regard and they stated that despite the efforts undertaken, professional ethics of nuclear technology remains immature. We think that nuclear technology is also used to develop nuclear weapons, which is against the just war theory and against the principle of harm minimization. And nuclear weapons don't differentiate between civilians and soldiers of the enemy and causes damage to the environment. The effect on air, water, and soil lasts for ages, causing genetic damage, lung and skin cancers, and many other life-threatening diseases. Engineers can make responsible decisions while taking up nuclear projects and keep in mind the code of ethics by protecting the health of the public without the misuse of nuclear technology knowledge to develop weapons with great damage. The destruction that is seen is not only physical but also mental. We can apply the risk benefit analysis to designing and developing nuclear weapons if we as engineers look at the available options and compare it with nuclear weapons. The risk of developing nuclear weapons is much higher it only threatens and destabilizes the security. The consequences of this weapon can also be compared with other weapons. Nuclear weapons do not differentiate between targets, nor does it take into consideration the environment and the after effect. 
It is important for us as engineers to consider civilians as part of the public in the first NSPE code of ethics, if they are from the enemy side for harm minimization. Now, Asmohan will talk more about uh, bioweapons. Well, uh, bioweapons are known as weapons that cause mass destruction, leaving people either physically impaired or dead due to the toxin that releases such as bacteria, contagious viruses, and others. These weapons are designed to have uh, no mercy on anything or anyone surrounding it. Not only does this end endanger people's lives and kill them, but damages the environment too. Engineers who design these types of weapons break the first canon of the NSP Code of Ethics, which uh, states that engineers must ensure the safety, health, and welfare of the public. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention view a bioterrorism attack as screening bioterrorism agents such as uh, viruses, bacteria, and germs that lead to sickness or possible death of people, animals, and plants. These agents can be altered to be more concentrated, easier to disperse, faster to affect, and harder to treat. Additionally, they are inexpensive and difficult to detect. Such attacks uh, don't put civilians into consideration. They are uncontrollable. Uh, therefore, respect for, our uh, respect for persons is applied to ensure that engineers don't present such weapons that harm uh, human beings and protect the moral agency of individuals. Let us talk about the positive responsibility that engineers have. Engineers should play a positive role in the rebuilding of nations because they are first and foremost the faithful servants of the public. In a post-conflict period, it would be the engineer's social responsibility to contribute towards the reconstruction works of an afflicted nation, afflicted nation and its people. The ethical principle of undertaking good works calls engineers from all nations previously engaged in conflict to contribute towards all people's welfare post-conflict. This is the same responsibility placed on the engineer as the one that caused them to adhere to principles of just war and harm minimization when designing weapons before and during the conflict. With my group, now to conclude, my group and I have provided vital information and justifications for why weapon design is, uh, is reasonable. We first began by considering the ethics in terms of weapon design for engineer's responsibility. We uh, then indicated the importance of harm minimization which is supported through the NSPE Code of Ethics. In addition to mentioning how motivation is a vital aspect uh, behind weapon design and listing engineers' codes, of standard, uh, codes and standards that must be followed. Uh, in order to justify weapon design, we also uh, had the case of self-defense. Uh, moreover, just war theory was introduced accompanying different types of mass destruction weapons that engineers should not design as their main aim is to cause harm for a great number of people, which is against the utilitarian rule. Lastly, we indicated the positive responsibility of the engineers through good works. Thank you, and this is our references.